and welcome to GMBN Tech Ask, where you ask us a question uh, in the comments of any of our videos using hashtag AskGMBNTech, and we'll try and get back to you on a show like this. So let's dive straight in. I've got uh, quite a long question here from Scat Silvers, uh, who's basically asking whether he should lube um, the bushings in jockey wheels. I'll put the full question on the screen. Uh, he typically avoids doing so, only uh, services them by cleaning them once every blue moon, uh, but he knows other people who uses lube. Uh, what's the real way forward here? Well, I think the debate amongst your friends is the same sort of debate we'll have um, amongst us here and amongst the industry, um, because there's so many uh, factors to play here, like what, use you, what lube you're going to use, uh, what's in your bushings or your jockey wheel bearings already, um, what you do for cleaning, etc, etc. There's, there's a lot of different aspects. Um, your jockey wheels will almost certainly have come with some grease on it at the start. And if people are jet washing or using degreasers, then they may be getting rid of that grease and they may want to replace it. Um, the sort of greases you should be replacing it with uh, will depend what you've got, what you prefer, what your budget is. Um, you've mentioned you've got ceramic uh, bushings here, so maybe a specific ceramic bearing grease would be ideal. Um, I haven't got enough time to go into the different types of greases, but obviously you'll have some thicker greases like um, assembly greases, which might not run very quickly in a jockey wheel. So if you want lack of friction, you want a more viscous or a thinner grease so that it runs quicker um, or the ceramic bearing grease for your ceramic bearings if you have them. Um, people using lubes, getting back to your original question, um, I can understand why they might do that. And yes, it might um, make them work nice and freely and keep them lubed up uh, effectively. Um, but if you're using wet lube, yes, it might attract dirt. If you're running in dirty conditions, you might not be, um, but it might be more um, inclined to stick around than say a dry lube uh, because it's wet and thicker. Uh, but what I will say is if you put that on bearings that already have a grease, uh, this, this is oil-based, um, some oil-based wet lubes will actually break down the grease. Uh, so do you want that to happen? Um, it, they're just, they're minor points. It's a big debate. Um, yes, it might help. Um, no, it might not change anything for you at all. I think it depends on how pernickety you are with your maintenance, how much money you've got to spend on different greases and how much time you want to devote to taking jockeys apart and greasing them up. So I don't know, pick a method and uh, stick to it, I guess. Uh, so, uh, Thij Loren Jessen, uh, terrible pronunciation there, but I'm really sorry. Um, I recently bought a new Canyon Lux to rep replace my Trek Cr Pro Calibre. Blah, that's hard to say. Due to the steeper seat tube angle, I installed a seat post with 20 millimeter setback to be able to copy my old settings. Is this a logical thing to do or does modern geometry ask for an other position on the bike? Um, I'm, well, this is cross country realms and I think uh, starting with your saddle and your pedal position or your pedaling position is the most important thing to do. That is where you start on a bike fit. Um, it's where we should all be starting when choosing our bikes because pedaling is obviously so important from power um, but also not injuring yourself. I think you're doing the right thing by making sure, I'm assuming you're making sure that you're set back so that your knee is above your pedal. That's what you should be doing. Um, and if your steeper seat angle has moved your knee forward over the pedal and it's no longer in a good position, you want it to go back. I think that's great. Um, I wish more people would be more attentive to fit like that. Um, I will say, however, with this new geometry, have you accounted for any longer reach or longer top tube length because if that top tube and reach was uh, identical to your old bike and you're moving your seat post back you've then effectively got a longer stretch by potentially 20 millimeters so just be careful of the front end when you move your saddle back 
uh, although you might be able to correct it by bringing your stem in if you are uh, still a bit longer in the top tube or reach. Uh, but do just think about that. Okay, my next question is from CRA55, who says, can I put my 27.5 uh, inch tube, meant for a 2.1 inch to 2.3 inch wide tire, in my 650B by 47 millimeter gravel bike tire? Um, yeah, uh, well, sort of, let's think about this. So 27.5 inch mountain bike is the same as 650B, 27.5, 650B. Same as a 29er uh, mountain bike wheel is the same circumference or width, for example, circumference or diameter of a 700C. So it's just um, road and mountain bike calling things by different measurements. Um, so your mountain bike inner tube will fit around a 650B gravel wheel, uh, for example, but the difference here is that your inner tube uh, will be designed for a 2. Point, well, a 2.1 to 2.3 inch. Um, so the equivalent uh, for a 47 millimeter gravel tire is a 1.8. So you're trying to put uh, a 2.1 into a 1.8 tire. So uh, the difference being about seven mil. So seven mil, so roughly about that. It's a, it's a very small amount. It's like my little fingernail there. Um, but that is quite a large proportion of a, uh, an inner tube tire, I would say. So I'm going to say yes and no. Um, it will fit your wheel, but when you, if you inflate it a little bit so that there's some, um, some air in it to work with and put it in your tire and see how it fits your gravel tire, have a look. Uh, if it's a bit snug and you're starting to have to move material around because there's extra material, um, then you might want to think about not using it. Uh, that extra material, not only is it going to be a pain to install, um, but it might actually pinch itself by folding and uh, deforming inside the tire. Um, the worst case scenario in this scenario is that having a wider inner tube in a narrower tire, if this continues to inflate um, beyond uh, the recommended pressure of your tire, for example, it could potentially force the tire off and blow off or um, uh, explode, potentially. Um, but I've not heard of that much, but then I don't know many people who try and force um, mountain bike inner tubes in. So I would say if you really can't afford another inner tube or two, um, then try and put it in and see what happens um, uh, with that before you ride it. Um, otherwise, just, you know, get an inner tube that does fit because you might as well have two spares anyway. Uh, so Greener's channel says, do you think pedal kickback on high engagement hubs would affect e-bike motors? Uh, so this question was on a previous ask um, uh, where I was talking about does hub engagement affect pedal kickback? So you'll have to go back to that ask um, in order to understand the relationship between hub engagement and pedal kickback. Uh, but in terms of e-mountain bike motors, uh, would it make it more or less? So in the, in the theory of things, if a motor has uh, a little bit of lag in the sort of engagement in the cranks, then that lag could effectively work in the similar way that a low engaging hub um, lag, uh, if you will, softens the feel of pedal kickback. However, if you watch that ask, you will know that I did debate whether people actually notice it, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and basically it's all theory. Um, so yes, in theory, the lag could potentially uh, counter the feeling of ke pedal kickback, but whether it actually exists in your bike model uh, or even in the world actually um, is debatable and pedal kickback, if it does exist, um, 
would only happen in really specific situations like going down a rough descent with your brakes on and your suspension sort of stiffening up. So um, go back and watch that ask and just think in your head whether some crank movement would actually help. I mean, that's certainly what O-Chain um, suggest would help. Steezy Reezy says, hi, I would like to ride my EMTB spec'd like a bike park enduro bike in a bike park, but without the battery as I do not have to pedal that much. Does the structural integrity allow that? I don't think the battery is a structural part. Um, no, I don't think it is either. It, it's very unlikely that an EMTB will use the battery as structural integrity. Um, I don't think they'd want to damage uh, an expensive part like a battery. It is possible, but I've not seen it happen. Um, so the short answer is yes, it should be fine, uh, especially if your bike can take out a battery, uh, then it shouldn't be structurally part of the bike. It should be sound without it and you can ride it without the battery. Um, if you can't remove your battery, then just switch it off. There's no harm in riding your bike uh, with the battery in and switched off. Um, so yeah, go ahead and enjoy your EMTB like an acoustic if you really want to. Okay, next question, Mark Peterson. I am an old school NTB guy and I have trouble relating to the generational gap in information description and meaning. For example, when I recently rode a brand new Nuke Proof MTB, I hated the feel of the geometry. Oof, harsh, Mark. Um, I'll put your full screen, uh, com full question on screen, uh, but you do go on to say, I have no way of understanding the goofiness of the new geometry feel. Um, does it really make it a better performance at speed on the trail? Uh, do I sound mad? No, you don't sound mad. You sound like a man who knows what he likes and that is absolutely fine. Um, I would say uh, if you like, you, you've mentioned that you like old geometry and not new geometry, uh, I would say over the last 10 or even 20 years, I don't know how much you're spanning in your MTB career here, but even the last 10 years, there's been a massive change. Uh, the trail bikes that I was riding in early 2010s even, which is only just over a decade ago, uh, are more like cross-country bikes of now. And I think I wouldn't enjoy enjoy riding the stuff that I ride um, on the, the terrain that I ride now is quite aggressive, it's more enduro, it's more downhill uh, oriented and it wouldn't feel comfortable to be on a 2010 trail bike uh, which is more like an XC bike of now. So for me, I understand the development and the development in the geometry is great because people's tastes of terrain has changed. If, Mark, your tastes have not changed and you still go out for classic uh, MTB rides, you know, cross country is not dead yet. Um, if you go out and actually enjoy rides and views and you just want to uh, ride around, um, then maybe a trail bike with all manner of sort of slack head angles and whatnot uh, probably wouldn't be that much fun for you trying to nip around and climb up hills. So maybe you did prefer the old geometry um, because you're doing classic mountain biking or good old fashioned mountain biking and that's just fine. Um, so the short answer is if it doesn't fit you, don't worry about it. It's, uh, you can stick to what you know. <laughs> um, Final question here, Mike McDermott says, Hi Anna, uh, thanks for the video on replacing Fox Fork seals, uh, but what are the signs and symptoms of needing to replace the seals versus needing to just clean or replace the foam rings? Uh, so if you haven't watched my how to replace fork seals, go and watch that um, after this. Um, and how should you know you need to replace the seals uh, is you've got to inspect them. So the seals are obviously around the outside of so the stanchions. We've got some forks here. Da -da -da. Uh, the very old forks here, but these are your seals around here and what you're looking for is any damage, any holes where water or dirt can ingress um, and if you've got uh, a little tiny um, metal ring around there, it's like a coiled spring almost that goes all the way around is that uniform? Is it damaged? Uh, are your seals still in? They're not popping out or anything crazy like that. Uh, then yeah, if they're all uniform and intact, you probably don't need to replace them. 
Um, and the foam seals inside, so if you're doing a lower service and you drop these lowers off and you get to the foam rings inside, um, if you clean them up in some oil and they, you know, they might look dark and dirty, but assuming they are still the right size and shape, they've not gotten all baggy, they've not got damaged, you can just pop those right back in. Um, it's easier to see uh, whether they need replacing when you hold them up against some new ones. Um, and if they are really you know, baggy and deformed, you might want to replace those foam um, seals. But otherwise, you can probably pop them back in. Uh, so hopefully that's cleared it up for you. And that is everything for this week. So obviously do uh, let us know down in the comments below if you have any questions and use hashtag AskGMBN Tech so that we can find that question and answer it in a show like this. Thanks for watching.